thank you. My microphone is on. Nobody has to come and go up my skirt or anything. It's all right. Okay. Uh, hi, Bristol. You look nice. It's my first time in the city. Really pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Lauren Curry. Online, I am Red Jotter, so please connect with me on there. Do be nice, because my mum follows me on there too. So the two things that I'd like you to know about me before we begin is that I am Scottish, if you can't tell already, and I'm very proud of Scotland, and that's a huge driving force behind the work that I do, and I also believe in better. I'm constantly trying to ask questions and encourage people to really question why things are the way they are and how they can be better. So I'm a designer by trade, by background, but I'm also all of these things. And I think when I come to events that are design focused, lots of different design disciplines in the room, I always try and make it as clear as possible how, how much better things get when we stop trying to put each other in boxes and we stop trying to label each other on graphics, UX, UI, product, all the myriad of different disciplines that make up really being creative because at its core, we are about change. We're about being able to be what our clients need or be what the people we're trying to solve problems for need. So when we stop trying to label each other and stop trying to put things into neat boxes, we start to realize that design is actually changing very fast in lots of exciting ways, and I'm going to talk to you about that today. And also, why I think that we're all guilty by association, and what the word design means to the non-believers and the non-designers of the world, and what all that means and what we should do next. So the first place that design is really changing is in technology. So as we all know, design is no longer about what things look like. It's about how products and services and really complicated systems work as part of wider communities and ecosystems. It's a game changer in Silicon Valley. I think we've seen several design companies over the past few years, billion dollar companies started by designers. And that's a new phenomenon, it's a new thing. And I think it's very exciting and also a huge message to all of us that other disciplines are really starting to take us seriously which means the business world all want a part of us as well. So we can see design agencies all over the world being acquired by huge management consultancies. Design is now very clearly a key path to business success. It's no longer an afterthought. And I think that's because design is about empathy. At its core, it's about people and why people act the way they act and why they need the things that they need. And that means that governments are also cottoning on to this notion of how powerful design is. And this is the bit that excites me the most. There are governments all over the world, Singapore, Australia, here in the UK, the Government Digital Service Team are transforming how government do what they do. And they speak really publicly and honestly about this is not about websites, it's not about apps, it's not about making things shiny or sexy. It's about fundamentally questioning the structure behind our public services and redesigning how we use all the public services that make our world go round. And that means that as a community, as people who proudly call ourselves designers, we have more influence than we've ever had before, which is such an exciting time. And it's really interesting and I think very timely because there's a lot of shit out there. <laughs> a lot of really, really broken stuff that is causing harm and pain beyond anything that anybody in this room in our lovely art centre with our lovely tea and coffee ever experienced. So this is the UX of how to apply for food stamps when you're homeless and you live in California. You know when you're being designed against. It happens to all of us all day, every day. On another level, this has been interrupting me for 2,384 hours, and it's really starting to piss me off. And there is a design team somewhere who's responsible for that. Bad design comes in all shapes and sizes. In Manchester, you have to read the equivalent of the Bible to get online. What's all that about? 
Somebody's designed that. Somebody signed that off and made that okay. And I think it's our responsibility to, to take a stand and to do better. And I was inspired to kind of give that narrative a bit of structure by this, this bar in Manchester that I walk past every day when I go to work. And it's called Guilty by Association. And it just really made me think of every time I'm in taxis are the worst, when a taxi driver asks you what you do, and I say I'm a designer, doesn't go down well. He thinks, they normally think that I make shoes or I make dresses, I make things look pretty, or they think I'm making all these shiny, sexy apps to help people get pizza faster or find their nearest laundrette faster. Shit that doesn't matter and that nobody needs. Now, we all know that's not what design is about, and that's not the type of work that we do, but it's our job to change that perception and hopefully create a design community that's, that's no longer guilty by association. And that has been inspired for me from a real passion for Scotland, and since a really young age, being very determined and focused on how can I do good for my town, for my community, for my country, how can I use creativity and design and all the skills that we all have in this room to make things better? So I wanted to be a product designer. I wanted to be the next James Dyson. I was going to make a thing and it was going to make me really rich and change lots of lives. And I went to university and realized that um, the world doesn't actually need more products. What the world needs is people who can think in systems and people who can design services and experiences end to end. And I discovered this thing called service design and realized that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to use design to make services better, public services, public services that help all of us get what we need in the times that we need them. So I looked around after graduation and realized that there wasn't really any design agency in Scotland who was, who was doing that. So I teamed up with my business partner, Sarah Drummond, and together we created Snook. So this was seven years ago, and Snook was Scotland's first service design for social change agency. And this is our business plan. So we talk a lot about inverting the pyramid, and as Gavin mentioned, all these brilliant people, nurses, doctors, janitors, school teachers, who make our public services go round, they are on the ground delivering great things. They are also acutely aware of why things are broken. And they are full of amazing ideas about how things can be better. But yet you have people at the top of the pyramid, people who control money and have huge power over where resources go, and they don't talk to each other. Now, I don't think design can save the world by any means, but I do think it's one way of flattening that pyramid and making the creation of public services a much more equal playing field. So that's at the core of all our work that we do with public, cli public sector clients, from care homes to the NHS, the Scottish Government, councils, charities, using these four principles in everything that we do. So I'm going to share with you some, some projects that I'm really proud of. So our first project was inspired, Sarah's uh, flatmate was burgled and had a really horrible experience and the police officer wasn't very kind and she wanted to have a, some feedback, she wanted to have that conversation. So if you imagine seven years ago where police didn't use social media, they weren't really online, so this was like very innovative at the time, they tell me. And we just, we built a site, we built a platform where local people, you and I, could go on there and talk to our local police officers, have a human-to-human, one-on-one conversation. And we piloted it up north in Scotland, where there was very little people, never mind any crime, but I made it work. I was out there with my raincoat and my clipboard, talking to people and gathering these stories, and our pilot made the BBC News, and it's not very exciting, it's about parking, but what is exciting is we use design as a tool for democracy. We use design as a tool to show a hugely hierarchical traditional organisation like the police how to talk to their communities better. And that chief constables laughed me out of the room 
and reminded me that they were quite comfortable giving their officers guns, but they would not be getting a Twitter account. But we used, we used the design process to show them, show them different and to show them what was possible. No Sugar was a, a project I was inspired to create by the really broken relationship that we all have with sugar. In Scotland, people drink iron brew for their breakfast. Don't tweet that. <laughs> but uh, it's true, right? We all, um, we have no idea of the, the sugar we're consuming. Jamie Oliver has uh, recently brought that to our TV channels and it's, and it's great. And I, I really think we need to do something about it. So I had an idea of creating a shop on the high street. Our high streets are full of empty spaces. Why don't we create a shop where you can go in there um, and talk to any, a sugar expert about how to live a low sugar lifestyle. You can buy products that will help you do that and you'll um, be able to get to grips with the sugar that you're consuming and the effect it's having on you. So as you do, I went out to Socky Hall Street in Glasgow with a big sign and asked the good people of Glasgow, would, would you shop in a shop like this? And uh, we gave everybody a sugar cube and they had to put their cubes in the yes jar or the no jar. And like 95% of people we talked to said yes. And one person tried to eat the cube and that was weird. <laughs> But we decided, we decided there was a need for it and we wanted to try it. So we won some money to prototype it and we hired um, an empty BHS and a shopping centre in Dundee and we started to prototype, to sketch and visualise what would this shop be, what would it feel like, what would the experience be of coming in the door and how would my mindset and my attitude towards sugar change as I walked around that space. And with an army of volunteers, we, we opened the shop for two days. And I'm going to show you a short video of what happened over those two days. for you to live a low sugar lifestyle. For two days only, on the 8th and 9th of August, the No Sugar Shop opened to test an idea that has the potential to change our nation's relationship with sugar. The prototype challenged Scotland's collective sweet tooth and shone a light on the amount of hidden sugars we are all consuming every day. We invited you to try our new products and services and give us feedback. A phenomenal number of Dundonians had seriously underestimated their sugar intake and we're really keen to fix it. Hundreds of you pinned your profile to the No Sugar Scale, talking to us about your relationship with the sweet stuff. You took No Sugar challenges in the hundreds and you spent time with our No Sugar expert asking more specific questions about your diet. educates, informs and inspires citizens to rethink their relationship with sugar and take positive action. Let today be the day that you begin to know sugar. Visit our website at nosugar.org. example of prototyping and what happens when you take prototyping off screens and off paper and you actually build a physical environment to test something. And it went well, it went really well. So now we are looking for sponsorship and funding. If you'd like a no sugar shop in Bristol, do come and talk to me about that. But the, the main message of feedback we got from people was that they just felt really safe and they felt really comfortable to ask questions that they would, they'd always been afraid to ask. And I think design is so, so often about really simple, honest human conversation and communication. And it was that notion that also was the inspiration behind Dearest Scotland. This was a project that we 
created, again, thinking about Gavin's message of if something's pissing you off, try and fix it. We were really frustrated around the conversation, debate, of when Scotland was deciding to become independent or not. There was such a huge energy on the ground that just wasn't being reflected in our media. So we decided to do something really, really simple. Paper and pen, we asked the people of Scotland to write a letter, really normal, traditional, simple letter to the future of Scotland. Not about politics, about your dreams and hopes and ambitions. And we crafted that template and we put it out there. Letters started coming in. We traveled up and down the country, talking to people about the letters. And we used our design skills to create artifacts, to create objects, to help people open up and feel safe to tell those stories. And the stories made us laugh and cry. We had stories from a five-year-old, 95-year-olds, really amazing stuff. Um, but the day that it really came to a head for me was one of our local MSPs put Dear to Scotland forward in Parliament as a motion. And that gets streamed live on the internet. So all of our team are huddled around this screen watching politicians from very different opposing parties stand up in the heart of government and read letters written from the heart that weren't about, as I said, not about politics, not about strong opposing views. They were about human stuff, families, friends, wishes, dreams, fears, failure. And it was such a powerful moment. And we decided that we need to do something with this. We need to try and spread it further. So we launched a Kickstarter campaign so that we could turn all the letters into a book. Um, and huge thank you to all the people who backed this and the brilliant team at Snook Kat Cochran and Sarah Drummond, who, who made this happen. And now you can get these books in Waterstones. How cool is that? Um, but you also have people very senior in government who are talking publicly about what this, this initiative brought for them. They are realizing that design is now, it's not about how things look, it's not about pretty things. It's about problem solving, and it's about democracy, and it's about bringing communities together to work on things that they care about. And so much so they asked us to create an exhibition in the parliament. And this is the space where MPs walk through every day, where they go into meetings and sit round tables and make hugely important decisions about the future of our country. And now they're doing that surrounded in voices of real people and real families, which makes me super proud. And one of my heroes, Nicola Sturgeon, has got her own copy. Excellent. Um, but this, this is about what happens when you open up, what happens when you give your design process away. We wanted to make this open source. We gave away the slides, these slides, the products, the templates, and now there's a Dearest India. There's Dearest South Africa. There's people writing to us who want to launch Dearest England, Dearest Ireland, and it's great, and it's, it's a, I think it's a good example of what happens when you, when you give things away and when you do things from the heart that you really care about. So design is changing. Design is, is becoming a very different thing for lots of people, and I think that means that designers are also now all of these things, which I hope is a step towards us being no longer guilty by association because again, we have things like this around us. In Manchester, there's spikes surrounding the Selfridges shopping center so that homeless people can't rest there. Now, there is a designer somewhere who was commissioned to build that. And, and that makes me really angry, it makes me cross. And that's why um, about a year ago, I decided to leave my business and leave the land of consulting and start to focus on education and start to think about how do we design the next generation of designers. So I now live in Manchester and I work at a school called Hyper Island. Newest technology around at the time, CD-ROMs, and they were really frustrated that they couldn't find people to hire. They could see this huge gap between industry and education. 
So like any entrepreneur would do, they bought a prison on an island and they turned that prison into a school. A school that is like no other school we are familiar with. There's no teachers, no homework, no classrooms. The learning responsibility is on the learner. And all the content that you get taught is delivered by practitioners and people from industry. And it's built on this principle of learning. And I'm really excited to have learned Gavin's new word, audictation, or I can't remember how you pronounce it, but that lo really long word that's about self-learning and how you can use the internet and all these amazing tools that are out there to be in charge of your own learning journey. I would love each of you to take some time today and think about what are you learning? Who are you being taught by? Who are you teaching? What's the culture of learning you're building in your teams and in your organizations? Because nobody else will do that for you. So for the past year, I've been working with these remarkable individuals from all over the world to run a master's program in experience design. And a huge part of what we do is get to know ourselves. And this really builds on the great stuff that Jason shared this morning on how you start to understand what you're good at, what you're bad at. What does it feel like to work with me? You're only going to find that out by asking your teammates and asking for feedback. We spend all our time in teams of people who are very different from ourselves. And at the same time, really honing in on that craft of how you design for emotion, how you design for the human condition. So they work on some brilliant projects with live clients. This team were asking themselves, how might we make it easier for parents and children to play together? They were really inspired and frustrated by their peers who have children who seem to find their kids behind a screen a lot of the time. And through doing research, discovered that Pinterest is a place where a lot of mums and dads go to try and find games to play, instructions to download, but it's messy and it's complicated. Pinterest is not really built for that. So they created this app called Playfully that rewards presence, and it's an online tool to encourage offline interaction. And they took it out there and worked with mums and dads and kids, and again, designer not being the sole hero that creates the shiny thing at the end, but a designer as a facilitator, a facilitator for people to build the products that they need and they want. And they're now working with schools to think about how might that play a role in homework and make homework a more fun, present conversation for families in the UK. How might we educate the masses on open data? So I don't know about you, but I certainly feel there's a lot of talk about data a lot of the time, and I still don't really understand what it means a lot of the time. It's quite difficult to get my head around. And there's such an amazing community of people who are brilliant at understanding that, and they're trained in it, they're experts in it, but there doesn't seem to be that good a connection between those guys and people like me who want to understand more and don't really know how to go about it. So they built a platform, Open Local, which is an educational space. It's almost general assembly for open data. And you can go on there and find a data buddy, which means you become friends with an expert and it's okay to ask them questions that you would feel silly to ask on Twitter or on a public space. And the students are now building this with Future Everything in Manchester to make it a reality. To things like, how might we make it easy to live on Mars? And why not? Because it's a designer's job to design for the future and to think about what life is going to be like and how we can use, what we can create to make those conditions better. So this team were really embraced the learning through making methodology and they made a, this beautiful object called Murphy that transforms into an object that you miss from home when you're on Mars. But the key question that runs throughout all of it is how can we become better versions of ourselves? Because the more complex these problems we're all trying to fix get, the better we all need to be at working in teams with people who are very different from us, working with clients who have a very different world view from us. And that's hard. And the first step to doing that is understanding yourself. 
So, guilty by association. How do we, how do we get rid of that myth, this perception that the world has on designers? And how do we bring along, you know, I know a lot of designers who are stuck in jobs where they feel like they're just building stuff for the sake of it and building things that people don't necessarily want or need or they're not really solving a problem that matters. And I, I really loved Gavin's two circles of concern, but I think for me there's some stuff in that circle that needs to be over there because if we don't start paying attention to the really big messy problems round about us, who else is going to, if not us, who? So what do we do next? The first thing I'd like to hopefully leave you all with today is that you're all role models. So each and every one of you is a role model to somebody somewhere. And I know that's a bit of a weird thing, but it's true. There's somebody somewhere who wants to be you, who wants to know more about how you got where you are. And they can only be you if they can see you. So put yourself out there, be accessible, be findable and help the next generation and people around about you who want to learn how to find you. And write more. So I, I get really frustrated that the, the design section in all our newspapers is still full of cushions and curtains and gadgets. That's not what we're doing. But that's our responsibility. We need to get better at writing really compelling stories so that this type of design reaches the headlines. And you do that by showing your work, showing your process. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really bored of lattes and sunsets and selfies and all the, a big part of what takes up those showreels. When I know that there's people working on amazing things and they've got journals and sketchbooks and minds full of really juicy, exciting stuff. But we need to open that up and let people see it because that's, going to, that's what attracts other people who are excited about the same things that you are. And if we all try and think much bigger, think beyond the screen or the pixel or the button or the, or the product that we're crafting and think about the wider system that that fits into and what we can all do to help join the dots more. And don't complain about things, fix them. So I have a bit of a, a rule for myself that if I complain about something a lot, I have to try and fix it. Um, I get really frustrated that a lot of the conferences I go to like this, there's no women on stage. And today I'm the only woman on stage and that makes me sad. So how can we, what is that? How can we all work together to fix that and make that that doesn't happen in future? So how can we be no longer guilty by association? Can we do all these things so that actually we are the designers that we are, and we can do much better work solving problems that really matter and take the brilliant skills and craft that we have and attack things that we really care about. So I hope that you've been inspired to, to rethink the things that you're working on and the types of problems that you're solving. If you would like, you can tweet me telling me the thing that you're gonna do next to help our community no longer be guilty by association. There's quite a few people all over the world kind of joining in on this hashtag, so it's quite fun to, to have that conversation. Um, and I'm just going to end with, last week I went to a, a house in London that was full of girls kind of 10 to 17 years old who are building digital products. And I was running a session with them around thinking about their future and what they wanted to do next. And this girl said, well, you know, I've always wanted to change the world for the better, but now that I'm 12, that's what's definitely happening. And I just thought it was, I thought it was brilliant, and I hope you like it too. So thank you very much for listening. I'd love to continue the conversation, and you still look lovely. <laughs>